Okay, good morning. Today we are going to finish our lesson on the dynamics for uh, robots and specifically for serial chain of rigid links. This is the only uh, robots that we treat during the class. In the previous lesson, we saw the Lagrange formulation that allowed us to obtain the equation This is the equation that represents the robot motion. Okay. It's the fundamental equation that we will use both to understand the movement of a robot and to design controllers. Controllers aimed both at moving the robot in free space and interacting with the environment, so exchanging force with the environment. So it's quite important to, that we do understand the contribution of each individual term, and we do understand what we can or we cannot do. Basically, this is a, a, an extended version of the second principle of the dynamics, force equal mass by acceleration. Okay? This is uh, the equivalent uh, of mass by acceleration. The acceleration now is a vector of joint accelerations of dimension n, n is the number of uh, joints. And then we have this uh, strange matrix. This is a mass matrix. n by n is a square, positive, definite, and symmetric matrix. It is configuration dependent, and we saw also the reason why it's configuration dependent. If my one robot is in, in this configuration, or in this one, the inertia seen from this guy is different. Here, okay. Here we have the serially, corially and centrifugal terms. They are function of the square of the velocity and configuration of the vector two. Here I collected all the friction terms in one generic function. Friction is not an easy um, dynamic effect to, to model, especially at low velocities. At large velocity for industrial robot is mostly linear in the velocity, a viscous friction, with a static component. But a low velocity is a little bit tricky. Then we have the gravity, function only on the configuration. And uh, on the right hand side, let me say we collected the, the external forces. Because uh, this is also non-conservative. Okay, so the, the difference is not conservative and not conservative, but more or less on the right hand side we have the external forces. Tau is the torque given by the motors. This is our input, let me say. This is um, the, the torque that we can provide with the motors. And then this is uh, the projection of uh, an eventual forces acting on the end effector on the joint. And we studied this in statics. Okay? If my robot is changing, exchanging forces with the environment at the end effector, the joint torques feel this interaction. Of course, we don't have uh, we any interaction given in uh, some intermediate point. We could have it, of course, in reality, but this is the model we are going to, to afford. And we obtain this model by resorting to the Lagrange formulation by classical mechanics. And we studied some properties of the dynamic model. The most important one is the one that I just, I just recalled. So the mass matrix is this uh, symmetric and positive definite. Then we have a kind of strange property 
related to b dot minus to c, but this is also as a, as a physical interpretation. We are going to, I mean, to, to, to go a little bit fast on that because <coughs> this property is used to design controllers. So we should know it. And then uh, we saw that this model can be written in a strange way. ignoring the interaction can be written in a regressive form exploiting the linearity of the parameter. Let us see again the example for the the example for the pendulum, the simplest robot that we can obtain. Here we have the dynamics the dynamics is uh, mass by acceleration. Of course, the uh, mass matrix now is one by one because the pendulum uh, is a one degrees of freedom robot. Okay, so it's very simple. And it's not configuration dependent. It's not function of the joint angle, of course, because the pendulum, I mean, is symmetric in whatever configuration. Then we have uh, friction, gravity, equal the only motor torque that we have. And we can rewrite this equation in this form. It's very simple. We saw it, I mean, it, we can just verify it by multiplied. It can be demonstrated. We are not going to do it. Where we do have uh, a regressor that is now one by three. Here we only have position, velocity, acceleration and uh, dh parameters so it means length and known angles okay the regressor this guy here is known here you, we do have uh, known terms and uh, we separated a vector of uh, pi doesn't matter, of dynamic parameters. What does it mean, dynamic parameters? Those parameters are the parameters uh, that affect the dynamics, and mainly, uh, namely, they are mass. The first moment of inertia means the, 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 the vector position of the center of mass weighted by the mass, and the inertia tends. Okay, for each of the link, but not for each of the link because not all uh, can be excited, of, of course, we will see later. Do we know those parameters? Yes, in theory. Because we, we both are our, our robot and we can easily, more or less, wait here. We, can, uh, we should know where the center of mass for each link is. We should. Actually, it's not always uh, so trivial because the manufacturer, they not necessarily give you those numbers and when they give you those numbers, they are not accurate enough. Could be better. Could be better means that you can estimate with simple experiments in the lab. Okay? And why do we need to know exactly those parameters? Because those parameters appear, of course, here, okay? Because this is the same or rewritten in a different way. So the first moment of inertia, for example, appears in the gravity, in the in mass matrix, and also in the coordinate. The friction, of course, only here, and the inertia here, okay? The better I know the model, the more advanced control law I can implement, or more accurate analysis I can do of the movement of the robot. It's a matter of uh, knowing my model. Okay. So now we are going to, just to give you some hints about the identification. The identification is important in every engineering application, and as I told you, uh, 
We have done it, uh, for example, in the lab during the elective class of identification filtering. And I'm going to show you just two plots today of some, of some results. <coughs> Concerning the Turing planner robot, for example, if we want to rewrite our model according to those two uh, equations, this is exactly the same but rewritten. Okay? I'm ignoring the friction here. Well, it can be demonstrated that we are not going to do it, that some of the parameters can be collected together in linear combination. And then for the planner to, to link robot, we do have eight dynamic parameters. The dynamic parameters are those one. We have some uh, first moment of inertia, some the length given by the DH table, the inertia of the motors, and so on. Okay? And this is our regressor. It's two by eight. Two because we have two motors and eight parameters. Now, it's not important to check each individual element of the regressor. Because as I told you, in the several of our applications, the, the symbolic expressions are so complex that we cannot check them by visual inspection. I cannot tell you if this is minus is wrong or if it's correct. Because it's too complex. This is a planner to link, so one of the simplest robots. Uh, for, for example, uh, our robot, the seven degrees of freedom, the symbolic uh, expression of the regressor, uh, MATLAB will not open the file. It's a simple ASCII file, but it's very heavy. So MATLAB will not open, we just over. And my laptop is not, I mean, it's not a bad one. It's a matter of uh, handling a very large uh, file. I don't know how many bytes, I mean, it's just, uh, it's just uh, the feeling that uh, is heavy. And I'm totally not able to, to, to see by inspection if this is correct or not. We should do some additional tests to verify if it's correct or not. And we did have a bug in our code. And we spent two weeks to find why the, 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 the physics was not, let me say, current. The bug is hard, as I told you several times. You, you lose a lot of time in the back in code uh, in, in, in robotics. And you should know the physics in order to find the bugs because sometimes they're very tricky. Okay, so we start with the identification. As I told you, uh, I'm just going to give you some... Uh, some hints if you like this uh, topic in identification and filtering. I think this year uh, Professor Marino also made uh, this as a, a case study during the class. It's, it's a, a typical one because it's too complex for, uh, to, be, to be fit in a robotics class, but if you have uh, several lessons, it's okay and it's fun and, and we have real data to work with. Okay, so we, why we, we want to, to, we may want to rewrite it this way. Okay? We will understand clearly in next lessons, but if we do know what's here, it means that uh, we are able to compute the torques that describes the desired movement. And we can Compensate Now, compensate is, will be a, a, an hermetic term for you. It will be clear later on. But we can compensate means uh, if I know the dynamics, so my controller benefits from, from it. Let me just give you an example. Uh, let us pretend this is a, a box, okay? It's not transparent. This is a box. And I want to lift the box. I don't know what's inside. It could be empty could be iron, whatever. If I do know what's inside, my controller is much more efficient. It means that if I want to 
to follow a certain trajectory and I know exactly the weight of this one, me, as a man, I can do it accurately. If I think it's heavy but is empty, what I usually do is something like that. I overshoot because I had a wrong model of my plant, of my robot. Concept as similar, and we will uh, we will touch it uh, in next in next lesson. So, uh, we want to to estimate pi here, and uh, I know that uh, I can measure well here. Q and Q dot are given as uh, variables that can measure it both. Uh, I never add Q dot. I always only add Q in in uh, in my experimental activity. Um, Q by means of encoders uh, at the highest possible frequency. It means that uh, in, uh, in, in real uh, applications at least uh, is uh, uh, 100 hertz. It's 10 milliseconds. Better is uh, 1 kilohertz and recent hardware also allow you to have a higher uh, frequency. So 1 kilohertz is 1 millisecond. Our lab, uh, we can uh, uh, interact with the robot as uh, 100 hertz, so 10 milliseconds. It's fine, but for interaction, could be much better. Okay, if I measure Q, how can I have Q dot and Q D dot? I should uh, make uh, a numerical derivative. Okay, it's easy. No, it's not easy. Because if I just say that this is the derivative that uh, maybe it's the, the simplest way we do to make a derivative, not the, the just the increments divided by the sampling time. If I do this for the velocity, it's more or less okay. Then I do it again for the acceleration, and I just obtain a, 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 a large noisy strip without any information content. I need to filter out the higher frequency noise coming from the, the sensor. Okay, so there is the need for some filtering before using it, and if I want to do it in real time, well, in real time, uh, it's not easy because you know that filtering introduces time delay. And time delay is, uh, uh, is a destabilizing action that we want to avoid in a control loop. We can have a Q dot, more or less, but QD dot in, in a real applications is either or noisy or introduce a too large time delay. Okay, so there are always compromises to that. Let me say that for identification, it's okay, because I can do it offline. And I don't know if you made some uh, filtering in, a, in a telecommunication, but if I can do it offline, it's okay, because I can recover the delay, the time delay. So it's fine. I'm offline. I, the identification uh, is an operation done once, when I just buy the robot, and then I freeze my pie, so it's fine. I can have Q dot and Q D dot without time delay, with a proper filter. Nice. Uh, I also need this one. I need the, the torque. Where can I uh, have the torque? Well, it depends from the hardware. If my uh, robot is an industrial robot, I usually uh, do not have uh, a direct measurement of the torques, but I have uh, the information on the current that is driving the electrical motor. From that, I know that the torques uh, has uh, a, a proportional relationship. So let me say that in an industrial robot, from the current, I have this one. In, uh, let me say, the new generation lightweight robots, as the one that we have in the lab, we do have sensor here, and we can measure tau direct. So in our case, we can measure tau and Q. 
Okay, but my relationship has n lines and p points. Okay. P is a number for seven degrees of freedom robot is something the order of magnitude of 50. So you have here 7 and here 50. And uh, this is always it's always uh, a system of algebraic equations. I have uh, the non terms, the box. I have uh, the coefficient matrix, the regression, and I want to find x. No? Yes. Is a tool that is coming out more and more in this class. But now I have more unknowns than equations. It means that I have uh, infinite solutions. But I should ju just make one observation. These equations represent <coughs> the movement of the robot at each instant, time instant. Okay? If I collect the data, I sample the data, and I collect during the movement, a movement, at each sampling time, I have n equations. The columns are always the same. I can add all the equations together, and this is what I got. So I can uh, sample for <coughs> uppercase N time instant until I have uh, an overdeterminant system of linear equations. And I know very well that this can be inverted resorting to a least square techniques. This is, of course, conceptually least square. Then in practice, there are some uh, additional considerations to be done, but let us keep it simple. In co conceptually, this is what I'm doing. Okay, so that's very nice, and it means that I'm uh, able to identify, and we are going to, let me say, to keep it simple, uh, and I just want to give an, another bit of information. What kind of trajectory shall I use to sample? Rich enough, what does it mean? This is a concept that is typical of from identification theory. In order to identify something, I need this to be projected on the, on the data. So I need a physical term to be excited, otherwise it's useless. Let me say that I keep my robot in this configuration for one hour. I take terabytes of data with the robot still in this position. The intuition tells me that I am not identifying the gravity here at all, because the gravity here is not exciting any of the torques. Okay. In this configuration, well, yes, but if I move the robot continuously, I excite all the terms. And that excites all the dynamics. So the trajectory is important. One example here, uh, I only have uh, two plots. I didn't have the time to, to, to put some uh, information, but this is just to give you an idea. Because we are working on this with, uh, with, uh, uh, with Giacomo and Professor Marino, and those are just some plots. Of recent plots. Now, this is an exciting trajectory. What does it mean? Uh, what shall I read from, from those three plots? Position, velocity, and acceleration of joint event. Well, what are we doing? We are moving around the robot. Okay? We are moving around the robot, and we have two uh, requirements that are counterbalance one each other. 
we want to excite the dynamics, so we want to uh, move the robot at the maximum of its possibilities, but we don't want to excite the unmodel dynamics. For example, we don't, we don't want to excite the flexibility. We don't want to, pro to, 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 to cause oscillations on the robot, vibrations, sorry, on the, on the robots. So the acceleration, if you look at the acceleration, it's more or less three radians uh, second square. And this is the maximum that the motors can give us, more or less. Okay. We cannot have, uh, I mean, one order of magnitude larger acceleration. So that's fine. The velocities, one radian second uh, is, I mean, the low-level control will saturate over that. So that's fine. Um, we don't want to. Positions, we don't have any specific information about position. We are just moving around. So that's just the, the, the position. Some of the movements are coordinated, so some of the movements are done in a synchronous way, and in some other you see that uh, some of the joints are still, some other moves. We put a lot of heuristics here. You can also have a, a very nice trajectory uh, following a very nice analytical, uh, analytical uh, optimization problem, but based on our experience, uh, if you move, uh, I mean, randomly and, uh, and with some uh, ex with some heuristic and some experience, the robot it's okay. And then, okay, then I identify pi. I have uh, a vector of numbers. How can I verify that this pi is correct? I take another trajectory. I move the robot uh, according to another trajectory. During this other trajectory, I collect tau. Of course, I collect q, q dot, and q dot. And I use the pi that I estimated, so that I have a reconstructed load that I compare with the measured one. Okay? So I don't use the measurement of tau, the pi is reduced, but I compare those with my reconstructed torque and uh, here we have a plot where we superimposed the measured and the reconstructed torque the measured torque are very noisy and we filtered out all uh, the, the, the band that is clearly let me say um, above uh, the band of our robot, but it's non-linear. So here we have the uh, 100 hertz is is uh, the sampling time. 50 hertz is the Shannon frequency. It means that uh, we should apply a low pass uh, filter with a frequency that is lower than 50 hertz. And for this robot, we know by heuristics and uh, more or less some order of magnitude of the data that from one to five is okay. So now uh, it's five hertz. The blue one is the measured torque. And the red one is the reconstructed torque. You can uh, appreciate that they are superimposed, more or less. I mean, the error is very small. Of course, we have some matrix to measure the error. This is just a graphical representation. And if you, if, you look at, uh, the, the, if you look at the ranges, they are not the same because the robots are feeling very different torques, the, the joints are feeling very different torques during the movement. In particular, uh, joint two is the one that is, is feeling all the gravity. It's most of the time is uh, with uh, 15, uh, 10 Newton meters, while if you look at seven, the seven is the last one. It's really feeling uh, a very, very small. It's not feeling gravity because of mathematical reason. And it's so light that it's uh, uh, moving according to a very, very small uh, torque. But that's okay. I mean, we are happy with the parameters that we identified. It's, uh, it's uh, a good identification according to the, the, the requirements uh, that I gave you, of course, there are some others that are not part of, uh, of the class because are a little bit too comp more complicated. Okay. Now, let us move to an alternative formulation for, uh, to 
obtain the dynamics. Uh, in this case, too, I'm not going into the mathematical details of all the equations that we are going to see in next slides. I mean, if you, if you just uh, add the bad idea to, 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 to look at the following pages, it's plenty of equations, okay? They are a little bit uh, uh, boring or, or, or hard from the notation aspect. Let us try to concentrate on the, on the concepts, on the, on the physical aspect. And I, I, want I want to try to transmit the, the main idea. Okay? We know from classical mechanics, since two, three hundred years, we know how to, re to describe the movement of a rigid body by the so-called Newton-Euler equations. Newton for li the linear part and Euler for the orientation part. Okay? And uh, we can apply uh, that the Newton-Euler equations, they represent a balance of uh, forces on a rigid body. And we can try to apply those uh, to our link. This draw is apparently very complex, but the idea is to consider all the forces that are applying on a, on a, on a link. We have uh, the contribution of the motor, we have the forces exchanging with the following and the previous link, forces and moments, of course, and uh, that's all. Now, the difficulty is that I do have a lot of variables because the, my, my link is connected to, I mean, to two other links, the following the previous one, in a serial chain of rigid bodies. So now the difficulty is, is okay, I want to apply this equilibrium to, to all the links. <coughs> what for, we will understand what for. We have already the Lagrange, but... Okay, this is... Uh, the Newton equation for a rigid body. So this is uh, first equal mass by acceleration, but now for a three-dimensional acceleration, because for the rigid body, and uh, with the gravity. The force acting on the link is the net force coming from the previous and the following link. I'm exchanging the forces with the, with the other thing. Then I have the gravity, and this represents the acceleration of the center of mass, okay? The Euler equation is apparently a little bit more complex, because now at the left hand side of the equation, I do have the moment uh, exchange with the, the with, with the neighbor links, but I also have uh, the contribution of the moment given by the forces. So I have four terms, but conceptually they are the moments acting on this link. Okay. That's conceptually they are all the same. And then and then here for the orientation part is not simply the inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration, but the, the, the exact representation is the 10 derivative of the momentum, so the, iner the, the, the inertia tensor multiplied by the angular velocity. Okay, and then the, for the motor uh, is the same, but let, let us focus on the link. Okay. Not going to the details, I, I guess that you have done something like that in, uh, in your career or not, in uh, your undergraduate, yes? We are not going to the details, but this is represented uh, with respect to the base frame. So the inertia of my link uh, with respect to the base frame is not constant, it's even where it is in space. I need uh, some uh, 
mathematics in order to obtain an additional uh, a simplest let me say um, um, formulation where the angular acceleration now appears ok this is for one simple link uh -huh. I can do I mean the same for the motor that care and then well then uh, if I do have the moment that is acting uh, on a rigid link uh, the torques on the motor is given by the projection of this moment around Z we should never forget that I can, I can write that this is the torque and I do know that I need to project around Z I minus 1 because uh, I'm using the Danite after the convention so I know what is the the, the, the position of uh, uh, the frames on the we are not going into the details of each individual terms as I, as I told you but what is important is that I have a rigid link I have two equations of equilibrium of forces and moments those two equations relate the force with the acceleration linear and angular acceleration exactly as forces equal mass and acceleration ok I need, in addition to, in addition to um, the Lagrangian, I need to compute the link accelerations. But let me say I can do it. I mean, uh, is 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 uh, kinematics? Is something that I mean I can spend some time in understanding how the acceleration propagate along the structures. But it's something that can be do can be done, sorry. I do have uh, my nice equation for the angular accelerations and for the linear acceleration. Okay, I have a lot of equations, that's nice. That is, it's not a problem. I can compute the acceleration of the center of mass and of course the motor. And now I have uh, all I need. I have all I need, it means that uh, newton euler formulation is a uh, a big difference with respect to the Lagrangian. Lagrangian needs to consider the system as a whole. I need to compute the uh, Lagrangian, of course, and then uh, it means the, 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 the kinetic uh, and the potential energy. And from that, I need to make some derivative, partial derivative, in order to have the equation to motion. Now, we are following a different approach. It means that uh, I focus the attention of each individual link in a recursive way. I don't need to build first all the Lagrangian, but I, I can keep my quantities uh, uh, at the link level. And uh, from the implementation aspect, the algorithm has a forward and a backward recursion. The forward recursion of velocity and accelerations and the backward of forces and moments. And those are just the, the, the equations that are rewritten. Since uh, I uh, we like to complicate a little bit things, uh, those equations are all written with respect to the base frame. Now, for some reasons, not going to the details, it's better to write the, the, the variables each in its own frame. So I need to to rewrite all the variables. From here, again, you can understand that uh, conceptually we can uh, more or less easily understand all the, the, <coughs> the steps that I have to implement. Then uh, this is already complex from the notation aspect. If I need to implement in a software, it means a lot of variables with a lot of indexes and, and a lot of uh, possibility of errors. Okay, that uh, usually arise. I mean, the, the, the bugs are, are there. Is, there is always a bug, no? Okay, so those are all the equations to be implemented. We did implement those, and this is a, 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 a block diagram that represents uh, the way you implement the equations. And in the blocks, there are the, the equations number according to the textbook. Okay. 
Okay, so now we have uh, a we have uh, a, a, an idea a little bit of what the dynamics is. And let me recall the, the definition of direct and inverse dynamics. Now I, I, we have uh, more information to, to, to recall it a little bit with more awareness of what we are doing. We define, is a definition, as direct dynamics, the operation of uh, obtaining the joint accelerations, okay? And what do we need to obtain the joint acceleration? Well, this is the direct dynamics. I have here the acceleration. And when I have the acceleration, as we do in this class, but can be also uh, prismatic joints. So I can have the joint acceleration by knowing this equation. I just have to multiply by the inverse of B. Am I allowed to multiply by the inverse of B? When I have a matrix, I, I should always ask me if I can, if I can uh, uh, invert a matrix. Is something that is always possible. Always. Why? Well, you should be correct. Correct. This is a question that I, I always have to pose to myself when I make an inversion, but in this case, this matrix is positive definite because it's a mass, okay? Cannot be zero. Otherwise, we have bigger trouble than a division by zero. So it means that uh, I can, uh, I can uh, invert it. Let us assume that I do have all the, all the moments. Okay, that's nice. That's, this is continuous time. Because I just wrote a very nice no, integral sign. I implement it in a, in a computer. I need to discretize this. That's fine, I can do it. Now, what's for? Why should I make this operation? I made my identification, I wrote the equations, and then I, I spent some time in writing this one. Why? The direct dynamics is very useful for numerical simulation. Because tau can be the output of my controller. And this is what you are going to do. The, the, the informatics students because we are going to for your project and for the, for the practice we are going to uh, to design also the controller at the low level so our controller will output tau and we are going to simulate in something like that and uh, we are going to provide you the, 
the functions to compute the mass matrix and uh, the other terms for our for our model. So we are going to give you the mathematical model. Okay. For simulation, it's very important so that you can debug your code. And as I show you in the first practice lesson, when uh, you have uh, a properly, let me say, um, a properly developed or pro designed uh, lab, the code that you run in simulation is as, as much as possible equal to the experimental code. So the bug is very important and if this is a good representation of the reality, what you do in simulation is close to what you will have uh, in, in, uh, in the real experiment, as close as possible. I mean, it's, it's never uh, the same for several reasons, but the time that you spend here is all the time that you um, save during for the experience. The experiments are always expensive, uh, ma much more expensive with respect to the numerical simulation. So this is time that deserves to be spent. When you write the code, if you write uh, a, a nice code from the beginning, you spend some time in the beginning, but you save it later. Of course, if you just need the code for 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 the exam. You just you know do quickly and patches and don't care a lot. But if the code uh, is needed for the, the master thesis, it's better if you write the code clearly from from the beginning. If you, the code is needed for the the lab activity, it's crucial. You should have a, a, a nice code, well documented, and the identity with, with the parameters. I mean, as close as possible to the reality. Okay, so this is direct dynamics. And what is the inverse dynamics? The inverse dynamics is, well, I know, I know, I know all the, let me, no, it's very easy from here. I know all the uh, left-hand side of this equation, I want to know how. I need position, velocity, and accelerations. In real time, so the acceleration is a little bit tricky. I need all the dynamic parameters. I made an identification, so it's nice, I do have it. I want to know tau. Why? For control reasons. Okay? For control reasons. I can compensate the dynamics. And this is exactly what we do when we move around, for example, an object. We estimate the weight and the inertia of the object before that we grasp the object. As I told you just a few minutes ago, when you have a wrong perception of the physics of an object and you grasp it, sometimes you see that your controller makes a large mistake. For example, it's heavier than you think. At the first try, you even don't move it. Okay? Or it's lighter than you think and you overshoot. Because in your mind, you have a model of this one. And you, in feed forward, compensate for it. And then you apply feedback with your sensors, for example, with vision. And you can move exactly the object, I mean, exactly, move them the way you want. Okay? But if you make a mistake in the perception of the physical parameters, is similar conceptually as if you here have a wrong pie. With mass, this mass uh, is uh, 50 grams. In my code, uh, I brought no, kilos instead of grams. I go and fit forward with a force that is 1,000 more than what needed. And of course, I mean, the effect is kind of fun. Okay, so this is the meaning of direct and inverse dynamics. Uh, okay, here there is a summary of model uh, differences. Uh, uh, just a recap of what uh, I said today and uh, and uh, last week. I mean, you can use one modeling approach or the other depending on what is 
the, the objective of, uh, of your modeling. Here, you will uh, receive the model. You are not required to develop by yourself the model. Okay, so you will receive the model and uh, um, you will work with a model already developed. Okay, we can make a, a small break. Uh, I, I show you the some code when we'll start. Okay, 10 minutes break. 